There we go. A couple more people have joined. Okay, I shall continue to admit people as they come. But in the meanwhile, welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. I, as you may remember, if you've been to these things before, I'm Jim Monsma, the director of City Wildlife, first and only wildlife rehabilitation center in the District of Columbia. And um, we have one of our very own here tonight. Somebody needs to mute themselves because I'm hearing my own voice coming back at me. So if you if you yeah, if you hear that, please mute, mute yourself. Um, we are joined tonight. Special thanks to our ASL interpreter Mel, who has joined us for a number of these things. We're very happy to have her with us. She always does a wonderful job. Very important to us that this that these programs be accessible to everyone who would like to participate. Again, if you're, um, turn your mute on please, because I'm hearing myself. Um, so a couple of housekeeping things. Number one, mute yourself. If you're not already, make sure that you are muted or else you're, we're all gonna be able to hear you and it'll mess up the thing. Um, and number two, questions at the end. Um, there'll be a chat. You can put your questions in the end. I will feed them to our host and she can answer them as they come up, but we're going to let her talk um, unimpeded for a while. Um, so our host tonight is Dr. Sarah Sirica. She is a veterinarian um, who went to the University of Tennessee College of Veterinary Medicine, graduating in 2013. And since becoming a vet, she has spent four long productive years doing wildlife medicine, earning her certified wildlife rehabilitator um, position in 2021. Um, and she is now the clinic director at City Wildlife. So she's someone that we know rather well. And her program tonight, as she will explain, is sort of a behind the look, scenes look at what happens at City Wildlife once our patients arrive. Dr. Sarah appreciates all sorts of animals, um, particularly wild animals, um, but her favorite topics in veterinary medicine are wound management, infectious diseases, and um, very important to us, uh, One Health. That's a big interest of hers. One Health, if you are not um, familiar with it, is the connection, the intersection between animal health, particularly wild animals, human health and the environment, which is one of Dr. Serica's specialties. Um, I will also add on a personal note that um, Dr. Serica is a very dedicated um, veterinarian, very dedicated to the patients she works with, um, gives her all to them every day. Also a very pleasant person to work with and fun. So I think you're all going to very much enjoy um, tonight's presentation. Um, I can go on for a while, but I'm sure you'd much rather hear her. Um, so doctor, take it away. You're muted still, doctor. It's okay, I've got it. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Okay, thank you, Jim. Um, I think you're pleasant to work with as well. Um, let me, uh, oh, can you see my screen as well? Yep, we're good. Okay, perfect. Um, so I'll jump right into the presentation from tonight. We're going to talk about from rescue to release. So giving you a behind the scenes tour of what happens to the wildlife uh, that come to City Wildlife. Oops, sorry, having trouble advancing. I think we'll be good now. Um, so here's an outline of what I'll be discussing tonight. We're going to start with the rescue and then talk about what happens uh, with the intake. So what happens when the patient uh, gets to City Wildlife. Then I'll walk you through what an intake exam is like and then explain a few first treatments of some of the most common causes that we see while they're here. Um, those will include things like orphaned wildlife, um, injured raptors, patients that have been affected by glue traps, um, and turtles with shell injuries. We're also going to talk about rehabilitation, which is 
the big reason that we're here. Um, and we'll talk about how with wildlife rehabilitation, we simulate the environments um, of the native wildlife. And we'll also talk about how we have to offer appropriate food for them um, and how we do our best to train patients for life in the wild. Um, then we'll move on to how we select that the patients are ready for release and then talk about release, the most fun part. So, First off, uh, we could do an entire webinar just about rescuing injured and orphaned wildlife, um, and we hope to do so sometime in the spring. Um, but what, uh, what we'll probably talk about then is how to assess need um, and what is involved in rescue. Um, but until then, you are always welcome to give us a call or send us an email. Our phone number is up here. Um, you will probably talk to Jim, Jim or Jen or Sarah uh, when you hear from us. Um, and and we answer the phone uh, seven days a week, nine to five, including holidays. Um, I think that City Wildlife does a really great job of being there for the community. So, um, so you're welcome to, to use us. You can also send us emails, um, info at citywildlife.org. Um, and then there's a variety of resources online. So if you're not in DC, uh, you can go to Animal Help Now, which is a great website that gives you information about who to call in your area. Um, and you can also go on websites like uh, the National Wildlife Rehabilitators Association, which is where the images are from on the right side of the screen. Um, and there's just really great resources about learning about wildlife in your area and who needs rehabilitation. Um, patients come into City Wildlife for a variety of reasons. Um, many of them are anthropogenic, which means due to human activity. Uh, these are things like window strikes, vehicle collisions, cat or dog attacks. Um, and then another common reason that they present is uh, because they're orphaned. Um, we really see a lot of rabbits, songbirds, and squirrels um, that are orphaned in DC. So if you decide, uh, hopefully with us um, or another knowledgeable uh, person, if the patient needs, um, needs help, um, don't be afraid to ask for help. So we have a really great system in DC where animal control will transport patients to City Wildlife for us. Um, this is really a phenomenal setup. Um, I have never worked anywhere with a program that works so well um, in coordination with us. And um, I'm really pleased to work with those professionals. Um, when um when we're interacting with wildlife it's really important to remember to wear your personal protective equipment um so we all know what ppe is now that there's been a pandemic unfortunately uh but it's great that we all know what ppe is so you want to protect yourself um so wearing gloves eye protection um picking the animals up with a small towel is often a great way to do it um just to keep um, keep a distance between yourself and the animal, not only for your protection, because sometimes animals can carry diseases like salmonella, but also for the protection of the animals. Um, some of our wildlife, like um, amphibians and salamanders, they can be really injured um, by touching the oils or the um, materials that we have on our skin. When you're going to rescue an animal, you need to have a secure container and location. Um, and this can really be things that are around the house. We get a lot of animals that are um, in pet carriers, which is great, um, but it doesn't have to be that high tech. Um, on the right side of the screen, you can see that we've got some brown paper bags. Um, those are how a lot of the songbirds get brought to city wildlife. And it, it's, it's low tech, but it actually works really great. It's quiet in there, it's dark, it's calm. Um, and if the animal gets have set and moves around into the container um, in, in the bag, uh, they won't injure themselves because it's soft there. Uh, so, so some low tech gear that actually works really, really well. Um, you want to keep that animal covered, even if it's stunned. Um, it, you know, it could feel a little bit better, wake up and fly around your room uh, or, or around your car. So we want to keep those dangers limited. And then um, if an animal has to stay with you overnight and it's injured, we generally recommend keeping a heating pad on half of the box if possible. Um, you can also do things like fill a water bottle or a glove up with some warm water. Um, if you do something like that, it's really important to have something between the warm source and the animal. So we don't want it directly touching them because it could cause burns. So make sure that there's some sort of bit of flannel or something between that animal and the heat source. And then I would say 
at the top of the list of importance, it's really, really, really key that we know exactly where you found the animal. Um, this is a variety of reasons. Um, if there is um, young, we may need to look and see if there are other injured um, or orphaned young in the area. Um, some of our patients, like box turtles, have really specific territories. Um, and in an ideal world, when we get the opportunity to release the animal, we want to put them back in their exact home whenever possible. That's best for them. That's best for the environment. Um, and so we really want to tie it all together. So once the patient has been rescued um, and either brought to us or uh, by you or by animal control, um, you will come into our uh, city wildlife main lobby area. Uh, you may be greeted by Sally, a pigeon that likes to roam around the office. Uh, that is our only captive long-term patient. Um, he's a great guy um, and I promise won't hurt. Um, so um, when you come in, he's standing in this image on, uh, on a clipboard. There's some paperwork we'll have you fill out. Um, this paperwork includes things like contact information from you, um, where you found the animal, anything that you observed uh, while you had the animal in your care. Sorry, I heard a little noise. I'll just, I think we're good. Um, and we need this information, particularly your contact information, for a few reasons. Um, one of the big reasons is um, oftentimes we ask rescuers to help us with release. Um, you may have more information about, um, about the environment in that area. And then we also need it um, in case we have any follow-up questions about the individual. If you have follow-up questions about the patient, uh, with a lot, which a lot of people do, um, we will give you a card when you drop off the patient with the patient number. So every single animal that comes in, um, even if you come in with a group of, um, of squirrel pups, we will, we will have three numbers for those individuals. So everybody could just make sure that they're muted. There's a little bit of background noise. I don't want to make sure. I want to make sure there's no distractions or any issues for hearing. Um, so jumping back in um, with uh, if you want to contact us, uh, we'll give you that number um, or you can also tell us the day that you came in and what kind of animal you brought. Um, email is really best for those details. Give us a day and we'll give you an update on that patient. Um, so while you're filling that out, we will bring the patient to the back to get care. Um, there's three places that that patient may go immediately. One is the waiting room enclosures. It's just a quiet location. Um, the animal can relax after it's gone through transport um, before it gets uh, the exam. Another place may be an oxygen cage. So if a patient is coming in shocky, they may need um, oxygen care right away um, and we'll move them right into that oxygen cage. And then another option is an incubator. So for patients that um, that are orphan in particular, but um, you know we've had this cold weather, all the snow. Um, if a patient needs to be warmed up, we have a variety of incubator sizes available. And then you may wonder um, who you know is is the patient going to be examined right away? Um, is you know what else is happening in the room? All of that. Um, the exams are performed in order of need and risk. So um, whoever needs care fastest. Uh, so in this picture, these little squirrel pups at the top, they look a little dehydrated to me. They're probably already warmed up. So their exam will probably be sooner uh, than the American woodcock on the bottom who's standing up, um, looks to be um, looking around and seems pretty stable. Here's what we'll go through for our intake exam. Uh, so we'll go through weighing the patient, um, looking at the species variation, go through the steps of a physical exam, and then we'll talk about lab test and our next steps from there. So for weights, um, every single individual that comes into City Wildlife will be weighed. We do have different size scales for our variety of patients. Uh, we get patients that come in from anywhere from two grams to probably six or eight kigs. Uh, so a, a big variety there. Um, if the patients come in in a group, like this little passel of baby opossums, um, they'll be assigned a band or a paint color. So for mammals, uh, we take a little bit of non-toxic nail polish and we either put it on the tippy top of their head or on their ears. Um, and then that color will follow them throughout their care here. Um, and that lets us follow and make sure, you know, that pink hasn't been falling behind in weights or, you know, that green isn't stealing all of the food from everyone. 
Um, with bird patients, they usually get a little plastic band that goes around their leg. Um, and for that, uh, we do remove that prior to release. I don't know if everybody noticed a little possum tail that's sticking in the wave end, but I just wanted to highlight that. Next, we'll talk about species variation. Um, you would think it's the city, it's just pigeons. Um, but we actually have quite a variety, over 100 different species sometimes per year. Um, so this slide is just showing an example of some of the patients that we have, um, sort of going clockwise from the far left-hand corner, the bird with the wings and tail outstretched, uh, that's a magnolia warbler. Um, and then we've got a ruby-crowned kinglet, a southern flying squirrel, a chimney swift, um, a juvenile house sparrow, and then my favorite migratory bird of all is the northern perula. Um, I just think that they're really striking in their appearance. Then we'll move on to physical exam. So here's a lot of pictures of a lot that's happening with different animals. Uh, so really we're looking at the entire patient. So nose to tail or beak to talon. Um, in the upper left, I'm looking at the pigeon's wing. Um, wings are just very interestingly adapted to flying. Um, their elbows uh, go out to 180, but um, in this picture, I'm actually, my, my index finger or pointer finger is on the wrist of the bird, and you can appreciate how far it can extend. Uh, so you can imagine that that helps the pigeon gain lift. Um, in this picture, you can also see the primary and secondaries, the flight feather of the bird um, and this patient has has really great feathers we can see that plumage we've also got a picture of an opossum showing off an oral exam um, opossums have 50 teeth when they're adults which is the most of any um, north american mammal um, just one of many very fun possum facts um, I am listening with a stethoscope to this American woodcock in this image in the middle. Um, woodcocks are a um, semi-migratory species that we see quite a few of. Um, they have some very, very fun uh, nicknames. If you if you look up American woodcocks, um, I really like Timberdoodle myself. Um, these patients often, unfortunately, uh, are window strike victims, and that can cause a lot of issues with their lungs. And so it's really important for me to listen and make sure it, we don't have any um, consistent problems. I'll also uh, listen to them during their repeat exam um, when they're moving out of oxygen um, into a regular enclosure. Um, we also have a picture of a patient being listened to with a stethoscope in a box. That's a cottontail. Um, some species that get really, really nervous in captivity, like cottontails, we do everything we can to limit their movement during the exam. So this patient is in the box that it came in um, and also has a little towel over its face so that it feels secure during the exam. Um, some patients we can't use a stethoscope for, so um, I don't have any pictures of reptiles on this slide, but if we wanted to listen to the heart of, say, a snake or a turtle, um, their scales actually interrupt the acoustics of listening to them, um, to their heart, so we use a Doppler. Um, similar to when um, a pregnant woman gets um, an exam, um, you can listen to the heartbeat. It sounds very similar to that when we're listening to a snake or a turtle. There is a barred owl on the right hand side of this slide. Um, with owls, we do a lot of specialty exams um, on their eyes. They really um, have a lot of interesting adaptations there. So we, we do a retinal exam. We look for changes to the lens of the eye um, and also make sure that there's no issues uh, with their ears, which are really important for uh, their natural history. Next, we're gonna talk about the various lab tests that we do at City Wildlife. Um, we're pretty proud of the equipment that we have. Uh, many, many of our patients that come in, they do get x-rays, uh, also called radiographs. The um, image in the upper right is of a bird that had a fractured ulna, which is um, a bone in the wing. Um, it's really important that this bone is intact or they won't be able to fly. And birds really have to have perfect, um, perfect healing in order to be able to release, um, to be released. 
There's also an image of a snake x-ray in uh, the center. So uh, we have this entire image of a snake uh, by putting the snake in a box, actually, um, and then shooting the x-ray through the box. Um, and then we're able to see everything uh, from the tip of the snake's nose all the way to the end of the tail. Um, they commonly get tail injuries at that tail tip, and so we might need to visualize that. Um, if you're wondering how we take x-rays of snakes in particular, um, we usually gear up uh, with some safety gear so that the x-rays don't harm us. Um, and then we just hold the snake um, and hold it out straight in a line. Um, and then the x-ray comes through the uh, top of the snake, through its belly, um, and we'll take an, as many images as it takes uh, for how long the snake is. And then we'll rotate the snake 90 degrees um, and shoot x-rays, what we say laterally, um, through, so through its size so that we can get information that way. Whenever we take x-rays, we take at least two views because a patient is 3D, but the image is just 2D. So we get a lot of a lot of information from x-rays um, in the lower right hand side of the screen. Um, we've got our little vet quarter. There's a variety of devices that we can use to monitor patients when they're asleep or if we just need to know um, certain things about them for why they're here. Um, so this device, it can um, determine uh, pulse oximetry. So how much oxygen is going through the blood? This patient's at 97%, so we're doing pretty good. Uh, this device can also do an electrocardiogram um, and monitor temperature. Uh, and then there's a variety of blood tests that we do. So uh, for blood tests, we commonly look for something called pack cell volume, which is the lower left-hand side of the screen. So if it just looks like a tiny tube of blood, that's okay because that's what it is. Um, and this test tells us information about how many blood cells the patient has. We need to know this because um, if they've been injured and they've lost blood, we need to know how dangerous their blood loss has been. Um, it can also tell us um, if something's been going on for a long time and maybe they're anemic from that. This test can also tell us if there's excessive dehydration um, or potentially signs that the animal has been not able to consume food for many days. So it's a simple test, um, but it gives us a lot of information. We also do a lot of tests for lead toxicity to see if the patients have um, been exposed to that and also for um, for rat poison, because that's something that's becoming an emerging issue in our city. Um, we also sometimes <laughs> do more and more blood tests, um, looking at things like organ function and uh, electrolyte balance. Um, and um, we do that with a variety of our uh, other countertop lead tests that are similar to things that you'll find in any veterinary clinic. Um, next, we'll talk about treatment. So uh, we um, most of the time treat the patients here, but there are certain patients that we tend to transfer out. So um, the bald eagle that's in the top right hand side of the screen, um, we can definitely take the bald eagles in and we can do their initial treatment. However, uh, we don't have the 100 foot flight enclosures that eagles need to be able to practice their flight and regain their strength after rehabilitation. So usually after a day or two, we we will um, we'll transfer the eagle to another location. However, um, there are many, many things that we can do here. So uh, we do wildlife rehabilitation of a variety of species. Uh, we do surgery. Uh, the little possum in the upper left hand is, is preparing for surgery. Um, we have laser therapy to help with inflammation, um, and um, we can take care of things like animals that have been hit by cars, um, animals that have been oiled. You know, we're not directly on uh, the coastline, but um, there are other dangers. So this blue jay actually was affected by motor oil um, and later released. So let's go through a few of the most common treatments that we see here at City Wildlife. The most common one, and I think that what people think of when they think about wildlife rehabilitation is orphaned wildlife. Um, so we do have a treat quite a few um, orphaned patients. 
And um, this is what we spend a lot of our time doing in the summer. We call baby season. We say the summer, but really it starts in about March and lasts to September or October. So not just the summer. Um, and um, the most important medical care for them is, is really getting them back to be stable such that we can be the foster parents for them. So we'll warm them up um, because they've probably been away from the nest for a while um, and we'll rehydrate them um, in a variety of ways. Sometimes we rehydrate them orally. Sometimes we actually inject fluids under the skin um, and rarely we also give intravenous fluids and then we feed them. Um, and we'll talk more about feeding them when we talk about uh, the rehabilitation aspect. We do see quite a few raptors and there's some really important things when we're working with raptors that we have to keep in mind. Um, so initially when they come in, uh, we stabilize them. They're frequently getting pain medication. Um, many of these animals have been through really severe trauma, like hitting a car. Um, so making sure that they're comfortable um, and not experiencing excessive pain is really important. If something can hurt you, I usually tell people it probably could be painful for the animal as well. Um, these patients receive a variety of splints or bandages, sometimes surgical procedures to correct their issues. With raptors, there's often predisposing factors that we have to address, um, and that just means something that may lead to the patient um, presenting to us. So perhaps they were hit by a car, but the reason that they were hit by a car was because they have lead poison um, and that made them maybe not think so clearly or maybe be a little more desperate for food that they were searching in the road. Um, each raptor that comes in gets checked for anemia, like those blood tests that I mentioned earlier. Um, they'll be checked for lead and rat poison, um, and most of them have x-rays to see if there's anything happening inside. Um, it's really, really important, particularly for our owl patients, that we protect their feathers. So if you look um, away from the tantalizing eyes of this barred owl on the right hand side, you can see that there is um, a little black and silver tab underneath of the owl. Um, that's actually what we call a tail guard, um, which covers uh, the, the tail feathers like a sheath. In the wild, um, these animals are rarely on the ground, but in care, um, Sometimes they're on the ground more frequently or bumping up the size of the cage, and we want to keep their feathers in as pristine condition as possible so that they can be released um, quickly and at full capacity. So um, this patient also have, has sheets up um, on the inside and outside of that enclosure um, for similar purposes. And then um, really importantly, we have to isolate these patients. So um, the barred owl uh, would love to be in the same room as our juvenile squirrels, but the juvenile squirrels would not love to be in the same room as the barred owl. So we want to make sure that all of our patients are comfortable and not stressed while they're in care. So we keep these animals in a separate area. Another really common reason that patients present to us um, is because they're stuck on a glue trap. Uh, so first, quick PSA, um, don't lose, use glue traps unless you have to. Never ever use them outside. Um, and please be get very careful of where you're placing them. Um, Animals like Carolina wrens, uh, which are little insectivorous, so they eat bugs, uh, birds, these patients uh, will see the little bugs that get stuck on the glue traps and fly towards them, um, and they can just really get really very heartbreaking injuries from that. Um, so. PSA over, um, we will uh, treat these patients with medical care initially. So we, we often don't even start with removing them from the trap. We put something down so that they won't adhere themselves further um, and then give them some pain medication. Often they've been struggling and would benefit from oxygen. So we'll give them that. Um, and then there's a variety of methods that we use to remove them from the trap. Um, sometimes we use a professional adhesive remover like ease off. Um, other times we'll use things like canola oil. Um, and then uh, we'll reassess their condition after that. So unfortunately, many of these animals have fractures as well that have to be addressed. Um, and we'll do their x-rays after that to, to look for those types of things. Um, 
generally while we're removing them they tend to get the oil or the ease off material also on them and so we'll have to give them a bath um, as if they've been oiled um, to remove the thing that helped us remove them from the glue trap so on the bottom of the screen are a variety of little bathing dishes um, you can imagine the animal started off on the right hand side um, and then moved thankfully to the left hand side um, there are varying ratios where it decreases over over time of the amount of soap in the water um, because these animals need to be perfectly clean um, with no soapy debris, oily debris, or glue debris on them in order for them to be released. Um, and sometimes they need a little help with their feather condition after that as well. Um, there's also an image of a very small, um, I believe it's a decay snake, it might be a juvenile uh, it might be a juvenile eastern rat snake, um, but uh, it's so tiny in the picture. Uh, we do get a variety of snakes on there too, and the snakes that are on the glue traps, you know, they're just eating bugs. They are not going to hurt you, so just keep that in mind when you're trying to determine how you're going to do pest management in your home. Um, moving on to injured box turtles, I, I very much enjoy box turtles um, and I'm happy to be back on the East Coast uh, with these guys. Um, unfortunately, they do get themselves into trouble quite a bit, uh, especially while they're moving around trying to find a mate or trying to find a great spot to lay eggs. When a turtle has a shell fracture, um, it is a bone fracture, so their shell is covered in a keratin layer, um, but on the inside it's bones, so if it's broken, then that's a bone fracture it's painful, we will treat that. Um, many of these patients also need to receive antibiotics. Um, and in the treatment of all of this, so we'll give them some pain meds, we'll make sure that they're stable, um, often we'll anesthetize them to deal with these wounds, uh, flush out any debris, you know, they tend to get dirt from the road, um, clean that up, and then we'll realign their fractures. There's many, many ways uh, to set these fractures up so that they're stable. Sometimes we use wire, sometimes we use electrical tape, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, HVAC tape, that's the shiny aluminum. Um, sometimes we use uh, zip ties and epoxy. Um, it really depends on the nature of the injury where it is and the physics of how to keep that aligned over time. Um, the um the shell heals quite slowly uh you can imagine it's a turtle they do indeed do everything slow um and it usually takes eight to 12 weeks for these fractures to heal sometimes um if the alignment's really great um we can get them out of here in six weeks um but very frequently it takes eight to 12 weeks um, additionally, um, their spine is part of their shell. And so if they've got a little, um, if they've got an injury to the top of their shell, which we call the carapace, um, then they'll frequently have spinal damage. Um, and sometimes they'll require physical therapy for that. And so I just have this um, video quickly of this tiny box turtle um, getting a form of physical therapy with a toothbrush. Um, in order to uh, regain its strength with those legs. Um, and this turtle was released. So I just very much appreciate him putting in all the work uh, to get out of here. Okay. Um, window strikes are another very common reason uh, for patients to present at City Wildlife. Um, we actually have an entire program about this called Lights Out DC. This is a program where many wonderful, wonderful volunteers uh, go around the city in areas where there's high risk for window strikes during migration season. Um, and then they tally up any birds who have unfortunately not made it due to a window strike. Um, and then they also bring any injured patients uh, to us to see if we can patch them up and get them on their way with their migration. Um, Many of these patients, they do come in in shock. You can imagine if you're trying to make your way uh, to the Caribbean, you're probably going at some speed and then you hit into the side um, of a tall building. It's, it's going to cause some injury. 
Um, and so the first thing we do, um, give them some pain meds, some anti-inflammatories, um, make sure that they stay hydrated. Many of these patients are in oxygen. Um, the picture on the upper left is uh, two little birds. Um, the one on the left is a common yellow throat and the one on the right is a Nashville warbler. I think they look like uh, sort of like twins, but, but they are different species. You can see that eye ring there. Um, but these patients um, are, are hanging out in oxygen uh, and hopefully recovering and feeling great. These patients do um, have quite a few external and internal injuries sometimes. So we mentioned before with Woodcocks, like um, the guy on the screen here, um, they do frequently have um, concussions. So sometimes even brain swelling um, or um, issues like bruising of the lungs um, or other internal injuries. Um, frequently shoulder injuries occur uh, with window strikes and so these are all things that we have to assess and treat um, the woodcocks really like to get eye injuries particularly ulcers um, and injuries to the end of their beak um, and with this species they have many really interesting adaptations at the end of their beak uh, where they use that to find the little worms in the soil um, that they're move, literally moving around the country to find more worms and then they use their beak while they're there to find that so uh, we want to make sure that we can keep all of those things healthy um, we usually keep window strike patients, even if it just hit the window, not migration season in your backyard. Um, we do usually keep them for 24 to 48 hours. Sorry, I just realized that says 24 to 28. Uh, we keep them a day or two um, in order to make sure that they um, they're not having compounding issues. So often swelling gets worse in the first day or two, and that's why we monitor them. And we have to keep migration. Um, in theory, uh, so they um, oftentimes migration is a tight window with some species, and so we need to know, you know, if it's already the end of August um, and some particular species really needs to be in South America by September, uh, we need to keep an eye on the clock while we're, we're fixing the injuries for the patient. Now we're gonna talk about rehabilitation. Um, I started off as a veterinarian um, and now am a certified wildlife rehabilitator. I have learned many, many wonderful things from rehabilitators who really come from, from all walks of life. Um, and I always learn something new when talking to other rehabilitators. When we do wildlife rehabilitation, it's important for us to be thinking about the natural history of the individual, and that's how we set up the enclosure, because we want to mimic their environment as closely as possible. Um, the cedar waxwing in this picture has a mirror uh, because this is an animal that likes to be in flocks, so we want to give them a friend, um, thus the mirror. Um, and uh, we also make sure that we think about human noises. So, you know, we live in a city, there's urban noise. So if the train makes some noise, um, you know, and we can hear that inside, that's okay, but we don't wanna chit chat. We don't wanna um, tell the patient how adorable they are. Uh, that won't make them feel more comforted, unfortunately. Um, and so we, we keep those things in mind. Um, and then when we're feeding them, we feed them according to their species and metabolic needs. And so what that means is, you know, not every species needs to eat every day. Uh, this rat snake that has a wound on its back, um, they, you know, will be okay if they only eat a couple times a week. Um, other patients um, need to eat maybe double what, uh, what they normally would eat because they're healing from an injury. And then of course with juvenile patients, um, they need to eat a lot very frequently. Um, you might be wondering what's going on in the image on the right hand side. We've got a little owlet um, and a person in a camo hat. This is because we want to limit um, juvenile patients from seeing us and becoming imprinted, uh, which means that they will be thinking um, that maybe they are a person um, and no longer thinking that they are an owl uh, to just really keep it at the surface level with imprinting. Um, and so we, we do um, wear a camouflage sometimes to limit our interaction with these animals. Um, and we also minimize our scent, so no heavy perfumes in the center. 
this is an example of an enclosure set up for a Virginia opossum. And you can see that there's a mixture of natural and artificial materials in it. Um, and we're, what we're trying to do here is prioritize patient well-being and their nutritional needs. So we want to make sure you know, that this patient has room to climb and interact with the area, um, but that we're also meeting their nutritional needs while they're here and making sure that they have things like clean water with orphan wildlife they have a very demanding feeding schedule um, so some of these patients eat every 20 to 30 minutes all day long uh, sunrise to sunset and so we are here uh, for 12 plus hours during these baby seasons um, and we're very thankful for our seasonal rehabilitators and our interns every year um, we're feeding these animals tiny amounts frequently with a variety of little devices. Um, so sometimes with tiny mammals, we'll use paintbrush, uh, paintbrushes and put them up to their mouth and dribble in the formula that way. Um, other animals like um, hummingbird nestlings will use the plastic portion of an IV catheter um, and we'll put the food through that. Um, we also um, are, again, trying to avoid imprinting and habituation. So we don't want these patients, um, while we are delighted by them, we don't want them to be super comfortable around people. So we don't do things like pet them. We don't talk to them. Um, we're just trying to um, as closely mirror their natural history as possible um, and at times find ways to put um, little foster moms, little um, stuffed animals and mirrors in there so that they'll feel comfortable by their own species whenever possible. We are doing this inside in the wild. These animals would um, not be inside. And so we do have UV lamps. Uh, you can see in the, in the main picture on this slide, um, there's so many pillowcases everywhere so that the animals can't see what's going on unless they're being handled. But behind that, we do have UV lamps so that they do experience a diurnal period. Many of the animals also um, receive vitamins and supplements while they're here, and their formula is based as uh, close as possible on what uh, their parents would be feeding them. Um, so uh, we try to mimic those ingredients as best as possible. Um, with mammals, we're mirroring the protein and fat ratio of their mother's milk. Um, for many species, biologists have figured out what that is, um, and so that's really helpful. Um, and uh, for birds, it, it's a variety of foods that, uh, that we mix and match for the pr appropriate species. Um, here's just a smattering of juvenile animals. So we've got a, a blue jay that is just very convinced that we should be feeding him more, even though you can see that there's further food in the background. So this is when we're weaning them from hand feeding um, and trying to teach them to eat from the dish. So what we'll do is often feed them from the dish with a variety of little feeding tongs um, and then supplement that with nestling formula um, as they're growing. On the right hand side, um, we've got a patient who's starting to fledge. So we've got their little warm incubator all set up and a little nest set up for them. Um, inside of that um, metal dish is a little um, crocheted nest and then there's tissues in that. Um, we tried to make it as stable as possible, but this animal decided that he wanted to be out of there. He is grown up and ready for the next stage. Um, and so you can see that. And then I also have a, uh, a squirrel that is suckling um, as it's being nursed with formula. So that is uh, what we spend a lot of time doing in the spring and fall when the squirrel season is upon us. So after we have fed them, uh, the next thing we'll be doing is helping them learn uh, to forage and fly. So forage is the word that we use for when they're finding food in their environment. Um, and so we wanna make sure that they can go from their little awkward cardinal stage, uh, little fledgling to being this just remarkably striking adult um, and make sure that that bird then knows how to go out into the environment um, and eat natural foods. So we will use foods um, that are safe from our environment whenever possible in addition to grocery store foods 
um, and make sure that the animals know what to do. Um, this also uh, provides enrichment for the animals. So enrichment um, means that we are um, giving them resources so that they can interact with it inside of their enclosure. Um, and so we've got a woodpecker on a log. So they're learning about how to hop up and down the log. We'll embed food into that and just really sort of go through school for them so that they're ready for release. We've got a pigeon on this side who is in the hallway learning to learning to fly. Um, we have a variety of perches that we set up um, and then watch them fly back and forth, back and forth so that they can get their laps in. Um, we will also acclimate them to the outdoors when we can. Um, we don't have a fully outdoor space built yet. Um, but we um, we do have opportunities to use secure caging outside, um, just outside of our building, so that we can make sure that the animals um, sort of feel um, feel comfortable in the environment before we release them. Particularly when we're at the more extreme ends of the weather, like in August, when we're all like, "Oh my gosh, when will this humidity end?" So how do we decide when it is time for release? Um, there are a variety of things that we think about. Um, so first of all, the patient has to be recovered from the initial problem and we need for it not to reoccur. Um, we wanna make sure that the patient will be able to survive. They need to be able to avoid predators. We want to make sure that they can find food through hunting and foraging. Um, and we also um, want the patient to be able to function properly within the population. So we want them to have their whole um, natural history experience, ideally including breeding and being part of their, um, of their own species needs. And I just really want to mention here that decisions are always made in the best interests of the individual. So um, sometimes we see a squirrel like this, this guy on the left with that piece of sweet potato in his mouth, and it is very hard to not want to put that animal in your pocket and just keep it forever. Um, but we know that the best thing for that animal really truly is um, to, to allow it to experience its entire natural cycle outside. Uh, we're almost done here. I'm just going to briefly talk about um, keeping animals as ambassador animals. So at City Wildlife, we're in a small space. Uh, we have one individual captive bird. I don't know that he would want to be called an ambassador, um, but he does live a good inside life. Um, but for many animals, that's not the right choice. And so we're very particular about choosing which animals might move on to a different location as what we call an ambassador. Um, the image in this picture is of Basil. Um, he is a Virginia opossum that um, came into city wildlife over the summer and now lives at the Smithsonian Zoo. You can go visit him. Um, he's very handsome. I, um, I'm pretty biased, but I think he is. Um, and so he was a patient that was, was pretty docile almost immediately. Um, and, uh, you know, when had this issue where he was missing an eye, he just wasn't a great candidate for release, but we did determine that he would be a great candidate to be an ambassador. Um, so then we're, we're ready for release. So here are some images of a squirrel going through its entire cycle here at City Wildlife from formula feeding to learning how to eat on their own, um, learning how to um, hide from people, um, store things in a hollow. And then we go to our release. With squirrels in particular, we do what's called a soft release which is where they, um, they're put in this squirrel box. And then um, after release, we provide them with some resources for a couple days until they're comfortable enough um, to disperse on their own. So a little bit of an extended release for them. And then here's just a video of some birds being released from City Wildlife. Hopefully the image is coming through well for you. So really is the, the greatest part of wildlife rehabilitation is, is watching the patients graduate out to the wild where they belong. And that's all I have. Um, so Jim, um, I see that there are some questions in the chat. Um, I'm definitely ready for them. Um, and um, thank you everyone for your time. I really appreciate it and, and how much you all care for wildlife.
Yeah, thank you, doctor. That was marvelous as we expected, and um, you did not disappoint. We do have some interesting questions, um, some of them quite technical. The first one, I'm just going to go sort of in the order in which they were presented, but the first one you touched on, but John is wondering, rehabilitating migrating birds, are they able to resume their journey, and what, what, is, what do you do about the timing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so it's definitely something we were thinking about sort of the clock starts ticking as soon as as soon as they come in. Um, what we generally do with migrating birds, ideally, you know, a lot of them, their turnaround time is really three days and they're out of there back on their journey. Most of our birds, we have at least a month or two. So we've got some wiggle room unless it's really getting late. And what we usually do is put them in sort of a green corridor um, so that they've got plenty of space to get back on their journey. Um, we use uh, we release many of our migratory birds in Rock Creek Park for that reason. Um, and we do make sure that they're ready for that that big long journey if they're not um, under um, rare circumstances, I would say uh, we would keep a patient over the winter um, and um, and overwinter it here to release during the next migration season. Um, alternately, if anyone has a, a personal plane that they'd like to offer up uh, for migratory birds that have missed it and would like a jump to the Caribbean, um, please let me know. <laughs> Thanks, doctor. And that has happened before, actually. But the um, next question, they wondered if the ulna fracture patient recovered successfully. I don't know if you remember which patient that is, but maybe we could broaden the question and talk about um, bones. Can bones be fixed? Always, sometimes, never? Um, it depends, um, <laughs> of course. So um, it depends on the species of the animal. It depends on the location of the fracture. It depends on how long the fracture has been going on for. So we call this chronicity. If, if the patient comes to me on day one, there's a higher likelihood of release than if it's been a week. Um, I do not remember about that patient, unfortunately, but um, the um, we, we do have quite a few patients that have fractures that do get released um, in their wings or in their limbs. Um, also, mammals have fractured limbs quite frequently. Um, with um, certain injuries, it's it's a lower likelihood of release. So um, with mammals and birds, if they have a spinal fracture, um, their chances for recovery are unfortunately super low. Um, but for reptiles, they have all these really interesting adaptations with their nervous system. Um, and, and they sometimes can recover even with a spinal fracture. So it, it, it depends. Wonderful. Um, I'm not going to be able to get to each of these questions, but someone, Shelly, would like to know, how much blood do you draw when you're doing a CBC on a bird? And what percentage of that blood is that? That's a good question. So I never take more than 1% of the body weight of a patient. So um, if a patient is 100 grams, I could take one mil. Um, but I usually take, um, so if a raptor comes in, I usually draw one mil total, even if it's a two kilogram raptor and I could take much more. Um, this is because I, I take the minimal amount that I need for the sample that I do. So um, for a raptor, I take a 0 0.5 mil, so half a mil, and that goes to our um, rat poison screen test. And then um, the other half a mil, we can actually have amazing veterinary technician. We can actually um, do a minor CBC uh, with a blood smear under the microscope. Um, and we can get our PCB total solid so that checking for anemia. Um, and we can get what we call a chem 10. So a small chemistry panel that gives us uh, the basic information about organ function and electrolyte um, and mineral balance, all with one mil of blood. Um, thank goodness. <laughs> Wonderful. And, he, and here's a nice question that I know you'll enjoy. Um, what percentage of animals have high lead or rat poison in them? Uh, I wish it was a smaller ratio. We're finding, so for lead, um, I have been in other parts of the country where all of the animals test positive for lead practically, practically and we don't have that problem here. Um, so when I see lead in patients, often it's a low number. Um, so, so not a 
clinical number is what we say, um, but it indicates that there's been a chronic issue. So we think about lead as a public health issue um, where maybe children aren't falling sick from the lead, but it is causing sort of silent damage. Um, and so we see those levels in our patients, um, not infrequently, particularly turtles um, and the opossums, um, they will see that low level of lead for them. Um, for um, the rat poison, Jim, that's something we have been talking about a lot because all of a sudden this year, um, it seems like over half of the raptors um, are having signs of rat poison or it seems to be popping up. So we have increased our testing for that um, because, because we're seeing it so frequently. We can treat some types of rat poison um, if we get the patient in soon enough. Um, we can treat them with vitamin K and sometimes that gets them turned around, but um, it's been pretty heartbreaking seeing how much we've seen. Yeah, good answer. We're still working on that, by the way. Um, we're testing lots and lots of animals, so stay tuned. There'll be more on that from us when we get a better um, data sample to, um, to talk about this. Um, Joe would like to know about um, the soap that you use to clean oil from birds, but why don't you talk about like just what's involved in getting um, glue trap? Because it's been quite a campaign, quite a discussion in the chat about how awful um, glue traps are. We certainly agree with that. But talk a little bit about how hard it is and what you use. Um, I know you touched on this, but what you use to get the glue off of these animals and does it always work even? Um, it depends on the type of glue trap we see. So um, sometimes it's those little plastic, it's like a tiny little box um, that just has a thin layer of glue on it. When, um, when it's that, we can usually get them off or sometimes animal control has removed the patient for us, um, particularly with that ease off product that we use. Um, I don't think that's something people need in their home. Um, if, if you come across a patient that's on a glue trap, um, you can either put a, a small amount of flour around the location where the animal has not touched. Um, do not use too much. I have seen a bird come in looking like a dumpling. So, so a little bit of flour. Um, or you could put paper down in the sticky areas that the patient's not touching and then just bring the patient to us um, on the trap. When If you just yank the patient off of the glue trap, that's a really common way that we end up with fractures. So, so be very careful of that. It's much better if I can slowly dissect the feathers off of the glue. Um, the um, So we do use things like mascara wands um, or... Um, cotton tipped applicators, essentially a, a long medical Q-tip um, um, with a little bit of the ease off or, um, or canola oil is usually my choice of oil um, to, to apply that to the feathers or, you know, in birds, they, they get their little feet stuck on there a lot um, or for snakes, they'll get their whole body. Um, and so I just ease that um, off and then um, make sure that they're hydrated, make sure they're comfortable. Oftentimes this is a multi-step or multi-day process um, where we're, we're doing this. And in the summertime, I mean, I don't think there was a week from June through August where I didn't get a glue trap patient. That's, that's another number we should probably um, look at, especially if people are interested in public education about it. But um, um, the, you know, the things we're using to remove the adhesive from them, that's another chemical that's not supposed to be on their on their feathers. The only things from that's supposed to be on their feathers are um, their own oils from their preening gland. And so um, we want to um, we want to remove that oil. Um, I do use Dawn um, and we're very specific about it. Actually, we were using a um, professional grade Dawn for our dishes um, and that got mixed in with our um, with our bird bath um, uh, soap. And I was like, what is this soap? Something's different. And they were like, Dr. Sarah, you're crazy. And I was like, no, it's a different viscosity. Um, and, I, and I will tell you that there have been trials done about which soaps work best with feathers, um, where they took individual feathers um, from patients that had been oiled and tried them in different things. And, and the regular Dawn looks great, works great. There's also um, a seventh generation soap that works well and, and one other brand, but, but really we use the good old Dawn with the little duck on it. It's, it works really well. Here's a couple of, this one will be our last question, I'm afraid. Sorry, we didn't get to all of them. Um, but 
people are interested in um, those animals that habituate. Are some species more likely to habituate? And what about age? Are Can older animals habituate? Absolutely. So um, there's a lot of semantics involved in habituation and imprinting. Um, imprinting is the term we use primarily for birds um, when they open up their eyes in the first couple days of life. I mean, they, you know, they come out often with their eyes open, but um, and um, and they see who is around them and the scents that are around them with vultures or the um, or, you know, the sounds they're hearing the, you know, the um, the bird calls or the people talking and then um, they they absorb that and that's the information that they think is important for their natural history. And so if an animal has been imprinted, that means permanently um, it will think that it should be part of the human existence rather than part of their individual species. Um, there are some um, raptors um, that are very easily habituated. Um, also vultures, turkey vultures and black vultures. There's some theories that it has to do with potentially them having stronger scent receptors um, in addition to just being really smart creatures. Um, those ones really habituate. So if you come across a juvenile raptor, be very, very careful. Um, I know that they're very interesting looking. They make adorable noises, but do not, I beg you, do not talk to that animal. Um, I don't play the radio for it. Just keep things calm. Um, stay away from the animal. Keep it warm. Give us a call. We'll give you the rest of the instructions. Um, with habituation, it means that the patients are um, comfortable around the animals. So, you know, we've all been around squirrels and parks and, and crows potentially that can um, think that it's great. Um, and, you know, it's a fun party trick sometimes. Like, look, this squirrel loves to come up and get nuts um, until all of a sudden it's terrorizing the neighborhood. So that's why we try to be really careful with our relationships uh, with the wild animals. Um, we want to share our environment, but we maybe don't want to share too closely um, our lunch. So um, the um, some of the animals can sort of grow out of being um, being friendly towards people. So oftentimes our juvenile squirrels, uh, they do know, you know, we have the formula for them. But as they're growing up, all of a sudden, um, they don't care about us anymore. They care about the nuts that we've left in a bowl for them. And so they, um, you know, and then once we release them after a couple of days, uh, the places where we have done the soft releases, they're not interested in the people anymore. They're more interested um, in what's going on in the other squirrels in the environment. So um, it it really has to do with how much we've interacted with the animals and then and then those species. Um, I don't know that I have a great list of species that um, become habituated easily other than the juvenile raptors and to a certain extent deer. Um, we do not rehabilitate deer at City Wildlife Zone. Good. Well, thank you. I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight. Um, if you have questions that um, did not get addressed, I apologize. There isn't um, email on the screen still, info at citywildlife.org. Shoot it there and we will do our best to get an answer back to you. Meanwhile, big thank you to Mel, as always, for all your ASL help. Um, we much appreciate that. And to Doctor, of course, um, for all the wonderful work she does saving countless animals every day um, and making City Wildlife the kind of place that we are proud to be associated with. So, and thank you all for all your concern, for all your good questions, for all your interest in our work. And um, there will be more of these. Stay tuned. Um, we'll let you know via Facebook, the website, eBlast. But thanks, everyone. Good night. And um, yep, don't forget the animals. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was so interesting. Thank you so much. Great, great, uh, great event. Look forward to some more down the road. Thank you.